this is how to get your release through the incubator. <laughs> uh, I'm Just McLean. Um, I've been a freelance developer for about 25 years. Um, I'm on the incubator PMC, which is why I'm giving this talk. Um, I'm also on the Flex PMC and a few others as well. Um, I'm an Apache member and I'm also a mentor for several incubating projects and I can see a couple of people in the audience who are part of, part of those, those groups, so that's good. Um, I have reviewed more than 200 releases at, the, at Apache. Um, some of them quite thoroughly. Um, I also happen to run an IoT meetup in Sydney and you may have come to some of my other IoT talks that I've given at this, this conference. Now, um, first off, I am not a lawyer. I have not been trained in law and I think legally I'm not supposed to give legal advice. So um, I am mentioning licensing and a few other things in this talk. So um, just be aware that I am not a lawyer. Occasionally I do get things wrong. Um, my understanding about licensing at Apache has changed over time as well. Um, and policy does change over time as well. Uh, sometimes it's complex and there's more than one right answer. Sometimes one project will do one thing in one way and that's good for them, but that may not be the right answer for another project. Um, this is why this is sometimes confusing. Um, I'm also a volunteer and I'm not paid to do this. So, uh, and this talk is my own views and may not represent the incubator as a whole. The incubator is quite large, has lots of people on it, and they have lots of different opinions about things. Um, if you hang out at the incubator mailing list, I'm sure you might have noticed that by now. Uh, so, um, the whole process of about incubation is to make sure that a, a project coming to Apache um, follows a couple of things. The first thing is that the project must comply with the Apache 2.0 license. Uh, it must follow the AF structure of contributors, committers and PMC and have the right checks and balances in place so that it, it operates like other Apache projects. There's a, there's a bit of freedom in there. PMCs are mostly left alone to do whatever they want, uh, but there are a few things that they do have to follow. You know, they have to vote on releases. They've got to vote committers and PMC members in. Um, they have to grant more responsibility via metriocracy. That means if they see someone who is contributing to the project, they should vote them in as a committer. Um, they have to ensure that decision making is done in the open. Uh, if it's not on the mailing list, it's not on the mailing list. You may have heard that. Or if it's not on the mailing list, it didn't happen. So, um, and also have to ensure that people act as individuals, not companies. So when you're on an Apache list, you are not representing your company, you are yourself. Your job may change. Um, that means that you may not be involved in this project anymore. Well, you may do, I don't know. but. Um, we, companies are not members of Apache, individuals are. Um, and all of this sort of comes under a thing called the Apache way. Uh, and most of that is, some of it is documented, some of it isn't documented, some of it is tribal knowledge. Uh, and we just hope that by going through the incubation process, we show you enough that you can come to the same point that other top level projects have. Um, so the vote process. Um, who here has made an incubating, uh, a vote under the incubator? One, two, three. Hi, welcome. Grab a seat. Uh, who here is going to make a vote? Right, uh, that's why, what I expect people to come along to this talk, right? You, you want to make the process as smooth as possible for you. I'm going to tell you uh, where I've seen other podlings have some issues. Um, and how to fix those issues. So anyway, the, the process is that the podling creates a, a, a release candidate. They have a vote on the mailing list, generally open for 72 hours, um, and they have to have three plus one votes and more plus one than minus one. Um, if that vote fails, you make another release candidate, fix, well, fix the error, make another release candidate, and then repeat vote on the dev list again. Then uh, once you've got a vote that passes, you need the incubator PMC to vote on that. And exactly the same again, you need three plus one votes 
and more plus one than minus one, but they have to be by incubator PMC members. Now quite often you'll get incubator PNC members voting on the dev list as well, and those votes can be carried over. Um, it's a good idea to mention that in the vote email that goes to the incubator list. Up then, if the vote fails on the incubator, you have to go all the way back to the dev list and go through the whole process again. Um, so you may not get this right all the time, um, and it used to be that the incubator was harsh, I think is the word, on poddling uh, releases. In more recent time, they've been a bit more forgiving. If you've got some, a few mistakes in there, the, your, your vote was still likely to be passed, but you'll be asked to fix it up next time. Can, yes? Can, can the mentors vote on a release? Can the mentors vote on a release? Uh, yes, the mentors are considered part of the PMC, so their vote counts. And if they're part of the IPMC, then they can vote as an IPMC mentor. Yes, that is correct. Um, and you can either vote in both places. Or carry it over. Yeah, we'll just say you've carried the vote over. So, yeah. So, state of play. We have 60 plus projects in the incubator. We have about 250 incubator PMC members. Um, not all of those are active. I would guess, mm, I don't know. A dozen people are very active. 50 people occasionally pop up on the mailing list and argue about something. <laughs> um, so there's about a dozen releases a month. And about 70% of those releases pass the incubator. These are stats from the last few years. Uh, a little recently in the last few months, I noticed that some of the releases haven't been voted on as quickly as they have been. Um, that's mostly because I haven't been voting on things, I think. <laughs> but there are other people who vote. It's not, thankfully, it's not just me. Um, so yeah, um, if you need help, these are the places to go to. Uh, if you need help with dependencies and licensing, uh, then go have a look at the legal previously asked questions. Um, that gets updated on a regular basis, so if you haven't looked at it for a while, please look at it again. There is an incubator release process, which is continually in draft <laughs> and continually updated, but uh, it has a lot of very good information in there, uh, and these are the two links there that you should go and read. And probably the best one to have a look at in terms of getting your license and notice together is the licensing how-to, uh, which is at that link there. So please read these. These will answer most of your questions. If you're unclear about anything on, on, on this documentation, please send an email to the incubator list and hopefully we'll fix the documentation for you. Um, there's also the Apache maturity model. This is not um, policy, uh, but it's a nice idea and you may want to look at that to see how your project is along the line to graduation by seeing how it fits in with this. Uh, so a few incubating projects do this, but it's certainly not required. There is also the legal mailing list archive. Uh, often searching through that will give you answers to, to questions like if you have, can I include this license in, in in my project, you might find that that has already been answered. It's not in the FAQ, but it's on the mailing list. And the same with the legal JIRA. Uh, that is another place where you can, you can find, sometimes find, answers. Um, this is roughly how I voted on more than 200 releases. So 180 of them, good. 54 of them, nah, sorry, do it again. <laughs> I try not to be harsh, and I, I, I and again, I definitely do say in most cases, you know, try and fix it up next time. But there are certain things that we look for that really, you know, you, you, you've, you've got to do better. So the, here's why I voted minus one. Um, number one reason is binaries in source code. The Apache Foundation uh, makes source code. We need source to not have compiled code in it. Uh, so that's the most common issue. Um, licenses are classified by category A, category B, and category X. Category A are licenses that are compatible with the Apache license. Category B are ones that you can include in binary distributions, generally. Um, and category X is you can't include them or depend on them. Uh, GPL or LGPL is one of the category X ones, and so 
on 10 occasions I've had to vote minus one. Now, uh, I do know of one occasion where a release was passed with GPL software in it because they got permission from VP Legal to do so. And they said they were going to get rid of it the next one. So even if you think that your vote may not pass, if you say we have these issues and we're going to fix them in the next release, uh, then that's a, that's a good way to go. Rather than saying, oh no, though, we, we, we're not going to do anything about this at all, well, we didn't know that was there. So quite often if you explain things, uh, it's more likely that your vote will pass than, than, than not. Um, eight of them include category B licensed software in the source release, which again is not allowed. And the rest of them are a few things, uh, licensing and notices issues. Uh, generally, they're not so severe, but just in some cases, you know, it's like, nah, sorry, <laughs> you need to do a bit better than that. Um, copyright issues have come up a few times. So it's inc included code that uh, Apache couldn't distribute or didn't own the IP to. Um, I'll, I'll come to some examples of those later. Um, missing headers were, were header issues. Uh, if you're missing just a single header or so forth, your vote's going to pass. But if you've got 100 files that are uh, missing headers where it's very unclear what is Apache licensed and what isn't Apache licensed, then your vote is probably not going to pass. Um, and there's also some restrictions on encryption software, uh, thanks to the US government. Uh, so you've got to be careful about including encryption software in your, in your code as well. Yes. Okay, so the question was, what type of encryption software counts as encryption software? And the answer is, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I believe if it's a, um, like a public-private key type encryption thing, and it's more than 256-bit encryption, you've got to apply for a license, an export license for it. But the rules I know have changed recently. I'm, certain, I'm not a US citizen and I'm not a, up on exactly what's there. Um, the information that we do have on the incubator is definitely out of date, but I don't know if we've got anyone who actually uh, authoritatively knows what the current legal situation is or not. So the best thing to do is, if in doubt, just go through the process of, of, of registering it. Um, and that is documented. So um, if you're using an MD5 hash, that's fine. You know, there's no problem with that. If you're using bcrypt, yeah, you, you, you need to do something about it. If you're using, if you have SSL code, you, you'll have to do something about it. Do, do you know what the particular example is that you, you have? No, I, I, I don't know. I just, the main thing is whether using the encryption library counts. Uh, uh, use, oh, uh, Yeah, uh, in some cases it counts, in some cases it doesn't. I think that's what it comes down to. It's not that clear cut. Okay. So Sorry. It means that doesn't pay if you go list yourself on. So if it's using typically the process on is go list yourself on this, this page as a matching. Yeah. If you actually are encryption software, that's probably more of a discussion because yeah, that's going beyond the book. It gets more complicated. So yeah, it, it, it can be complicated and it's a complicated legal situation. Um, so, but there will be people who can help, and there's a, a fallback is that you just say, yeah, I'm using it, and then you're covered, basically. So, um, a minus one vote is not a veto. So, just because you get a minus one vote on a release doesn't mean you have to do it again. Um, it may be that I'm feeling particularly grumpy that day, <laughs> and it's like, nah, don't like that. <laughs> um, if someone votes minus one, you can try to change their mind. Uh, you can say, all right, I'll try and fix this up in the next release. Uh, or you might say, well, it's not so much of a problem because of whatever. Um, so don't be discouraged if you get your release, put it up there, and you immediately get a, a, a minus one. Um, people will also put up conditional votes. They'll say, OK, minus one unless you fix this in the next release. And if you say, I'm going to fix this in the next release, and here's the Jira, then good, I'll change my vote. So. Um, that being said, if generally if someone votes minus one, there's probably a good reason why they did so. Uh, so there probably is something that needs to be fixed there, um, and you should look into it and try and fix it in the next release. But it doesn't have to be perfect. The whole point of an incubating project is that you don't have to get it right first go. You're trying to learn this process. 
and, and go through with it. And you may not be familiar with ASF policy or licensing rules or everything at the start. Um, our policy certainly has gaps in it. It doesn't cover everything. There are odd situations that come up around licensing all the time. So um, just point it out in the release candidate. If you have something odd in there and you're not too sure what to deal with it, just say, okay, we've done this. This is what we thought was the best idea to, to do this. Um, if it has no surprises inside it, that's a good thing. All right, make it easy to review. <laughs> Um, people on the incubator PMC are volunteers. Their time is limited. Um, don't make them think too hard about it. <laughs> All right. Uh, provide well-named artifacts. Don't try to be clever with licensing or headers. Uh, include compile instructions in the actual release. Don't point them to a web page. <laughs> and make it easy to compile if you can. Right? All of those things will make it means that it's much more likely that someone will have a look at your release and vote plus one on it. Now, I, our incubator PMC documentation can sometimes be confusing, can sometimes be out of date. Uh, in recent times, it's actually improved uh, significantly, I think. But there is still a lot of cultural knowledge that isn't well documented, um, and the PMC is large and has a lot of differing opinions on, on what is correct. I think there's mostly consensus about, around most things, but occasionally there's a few edge cases. Uh, like in terms of binaries inside source releases, there are some exceptions for build tools, and there's sort of a bit of a debate that's been going on recently about what you can include in the source release and not if it's a build tool. Um, often there's multiple ways to solve the same issue. Um, so I think the right answer here is if, if there's any doubt, like should I, should I leave this header alone or should I include this header on this file, just do so. It, it makes it easy. And it's, it's often by including a header that you don't need, say an MIT license for example, um, you're not making a licensing error, it's just a documentation error. But if you leave that license out, it is a licensing error uh, and it needs to be in there. So uh, often there's a a path that you can go down that, while it may not be 100% correct, it's okay. So um, some of the problems I see come from copying what top level projects have done. Um, just, I'm not saying that any top level projects have done the wrong thing, because that's not part of the incubator's responsibility. Uh, but policy does change it over time, and there may be historical reasons for why a project is doing something in a certain way. Uh, it may not be immediately obvious why you know, that's happening. So just take care when looking at top-level projects and the examples, and don't just blindly copy what they've done. Um, yeah, in particular, a couple of big data projects, but I'll, I won't mention any names. Uh, it's a better idea to have a look at projects that have recently graduated. So um, one of the other things is that in order to pass a vote, uh, releases must be uh, signed. Um, it's a good idea to use an apache.org email address rather than a oh, mine's going, hotmail address, <laughs> as I've seen on one occasion. <laughs> You know, random person 27 at hotmail.com. Uh, I don't know who you are. I'm not sure I trust this release. <laughs> so use your Apache release to, to sign it. Um, make sure you have a disclaimer in your release. Uh, it's, n it's not required to actually put it in a file called disclaimer. It can actually be on the website. I, I look through the documentation, that's what it says. Um, most common though, it's actually put in a file called disclaimer. Sometimes the disclaimer is also put in the readme and, and both of those, those are fine. Yes? Just to remind me, the disclaimer is, this is an incubator project? Yeah, yeah, the, the disclaimer just says this is an incubator project. Um, I can't remember the exact wording, but yeah, it's... Almost every single project has one and you just take another one and just copy the name. So. Um, good idea to tag releases. Not essential, but it's a good idea. That means you can recreate the, the release at a later date. And um, it also means that you can easily compare what is actually in the source release to what is tagged in GitHub. Uh, well, Subversion, if you're using Subversion. Um, so 
Um, just one word of caution is that Git tags can be edited and changed. So make sure you provide the hash in the vote email. So that at, at some future point in time, if we ever had to go back and recreate the software from scratch from, from version control, we could double check that. Uh, licensing. This is where a lot of issues seem to occur. Um, and I think some of it is that most of us are just developers and don't really want to understand licensing. It's just like, why do I need to know that? It's all too hard and complex and, <laughs> you know. Um, and it's certainly a language barrier as well. Even for people who speak English, it's, it can sometimes be hard to understand what something actually means. Uh, and it can certainly be complex and policy can change over time as well. So um, you, you do need to keep up to date with this. Um, I, I have to say though that we're not the only people who have difficulty with licensing. If you look at open source projects in general, Apache tends to be a lot better, much, much better on average than some random project on GitHub. Um, uh, and that can cause some problems if you start using stuff on GitHub in your own project or from elsewhere. Um, external projects often have unclear licenses. They often include code under different licenses and don't mention that. Um, sometimes they're incompatible. So you'll see a project that is licensed MIT, but it contains GPL code in it. It's like, ah, uh, that's not good. Um, if they are Apache licensed, they generally are missing a license, a notice file, which is, is required by ASF policy, but it's not required by the Apache 2.0 license, but that causes problems if you want to try and include it in your own, own project. Um, some of them try to be funny. Don't do that. <laughs> um, here's one trying to be funny. Um, this is from uh, Android. Um, it has... 33 copies of BSD in it. <laughs> yeah, it's got, uh, I think most of them are the same, but there are a couple of variations in there. Yeah, but it's just like, why would you do that? Um, here's a check-in for a license that I don't know if you can read that. Uh, but it is, uh, they've changed the license from um, um, w, uh, um, yeah, I'm going to say that. What the fuck, public license? <laughs> to, uh, or it's do whatever the what you want license, basically, um, which is actually a permissive license under the Apache license. Um, it, there was some debate about it, whether it was actually too permissive, <laughs> and doing what you want could mean you could ignore patents and copyright and... IP and all sorts of other things, but it was decided that it was okay. Um, so they had to change the license from that to, I think it's MIT, no, ISC, um, and yeah, because of Lintel, uh, Intel lawyers complained about the, the license. <laughs> it's like, ah, whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that, that's, the <laughs> that's the Gitter, the tag on it. <laughs> um, this is a nice license. Uh, have I got this? Um, yeah, only dead people can use the code. <laughs> well, sorry, only living people can be used the code. It's, it's like, <laughs> yeah, don't do this. This file's good. Up the top of it, we have a GPL. At the bottom of it, we have a BSD. <laughs> How is it licensed? I've got no idea. <laughs> So yeah, as I was saying, just try and err on the side of caution. So it, it's better to say, if, if you're including something and it's MIT license, but you, you know, for whatever reason, you may not be 100% sure whether you should include an MIT header or in, include the license information, just do so anyway. Um, worst case, it, you didn't have to include it, but that's okay. Oh, sorry, best case is you, you didn't have to include it and that's okay. And you know, that's a minor issue, but nothing. That can be fixed in a future release, but not having that MIT license there is actually not agreeing with the terms of the MIT license. Um, so basically, the whole principle behind this is the concept of a universal donor, which gives anyone confidence that they can use our software without any legal issues. Um, and that's a big thing. Um, it means that all software with inside a release is compatible with the Apache 2.0 license, and it means it can be used for any commercial and non-commercial purposes. Uh, 
So most large companies are going to get their lawyers to go over everything and you know check it, uh, but that's them. But it, 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 it means that you can have confidence in using the software without having legal risk, uh, which is a big thing. So when you're assembling a, a release, there's a guiding principle, um, and that is that the license and notice files must represent the contents of the distribution that they're, that they're in. So don't mention stuff that's not bundled. Uh, if you have an external dependency that you link to, um, but it's not actually included in the source release, it doesn't have to be in the license, as long as it's compatible with the Apache license. So, uh, and this applies to both source and binary artifacts. So, your source and binary artifacts may actually have different license and notice files. So, that is a, a common mistake. Yeah, question at the back there. Where, where do we put that information if it's useful for anyone using the software that wants to know what are the dependencies? Uh, you can make a dependency file and put it in that, or you could put it in your README. That's yeah, either was be fine. There's no, there's no ASF policy on, on doing that, so it's up to the PMC to do that however they want. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of, anyway. Um, yeah, so when you're bundling stuff, have a look to see what's actually inside it. Um, sometimes you may get some surprises. <laughs> um, particular, look for category B and category X software. Again, that the, those categories are listed in the legal FAQ. Um, look for photos or fonts or other resources that you may not have permission to um, distribute. Um, now, it doesn't mean you have to go through every single file and look at it with a magnifying glass. Um, you know, you have to make some assumptions at some point in time and quite often you know, you don't know if someone's copied two lines off Stack Overflow and pasted it in into your code. So uh, it's, but you know, just have a look to see what's actually in there, um, and you may find some surprises. Um, one good way to check for those surprises is to use Rat. Who here's heard of Rat? Well, uses Rat? Yeah, cool. Okay, um, it's a good tool for finding binaries and licenses in your source release. It's not perfect. Uh, it only understands about a few licenses. And it doesn't find odd things like double headers. If you've got that issue that I showed you before with the BSD and the GPL license in it, it won't detect that. Um, uh, another question up the back there? Just, just to repeat this one, um, when you do the release and you have a, let's say, uh, source, mm -hmm. so it means I, I can exclude things from the source control repo Yep. I do the release, for example, uh, tests, pictures or yeah yeah you, you may when when you're things. making making a source release you may exclude some things from the source bundle that you put in you may put them in there or you rat may complain about things and you'll put a rat exclusion file in there so it doesn't complain about them um, just so you know I generally run rat manually without exclusion files so I can have a good look at everything because that's sometimes a common issue is that the exclusion files are too wide and they, they miss things that get put in there um, yeah, so uh, you just be a little bit careful with the exclusions. So um, this is what the rat output looks like. Um, it's sort of quite nice. Uh, so that's just showing you, you know, what files have unapproved licenses in there and whether or not it has a license or a, a notice file um, and that sort of thing. And whether or not you've got any binary files in there. And you can see some MIT license files there uh, 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 as well. Um, there's also this website, Compliance Rocks. Um, it's like RAT, but gives slightly different results. Uh, good idea to run both. Hello, goodbye. <laughs> so, all right, and this is what the output of that looks. So you up, basically upload a zip file, it compiles it, tells you what's there, what's not there, uh, all the rest. Um, this is what I generally do, though. I actually use the command line quite a lot. Um, if I'm trying to find licenses, I use this little script here, this nice little grep script. And I generally pipe it to, um, to uh, sort unique, so um, I, I get things. So you just search for common license names, like GPL, BSD, MID, and that'll generally pick them up straight away. Um, also search for copyright and, and see what that gives as well. So it's not perfect, but you know, it, 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 it's a nice way of doing it that gives you a... <laughs> hey. 
Come on in. <laughs> um, JavaScript. JavaScript files are a pain. I'll just say that again because the door closed. JavaScript files are a pain, often because they're minified and they're missing license headers. So you often have to then find out what the JavaScript files are, go find out where they're hosted, find what the license is. Um, and a lot of them are not under, under licenses that are not compatible with the Apache license. Um, so you have to be a little careful with that. Um, also, a lot of JavaScript files, the licensing has changed between versions. So you have to know what version you're including as well to, to make it doubly sure. Uh, so you may have to look very clearly, carefully, and they also may include other JavaScript files either embedded inside them or, or whatever. So uh, you need to, 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 to look at that. Um, jQuery and Bootstrap are, are two that bundle other stuff inside them as well. Um, I had to vote minus one on a release once because it had a cat photo in it. <laughs> um, it was a professional photographer's cat photo. They just wanted a big photo that they could put in there and they liked the picture of the cat. Um, I'm sorry, you can't do that. <laughs> I didn't want to vote minus one on it, but you know, you can't take something that you don't have permission to distribute um, and include it in a release. Uh, so generally, what I do is I say, you know, let's have a look at all the images, copy them into a, to a folder, and then just view those as icons and see what's there. Um, and then if anything jumps out at me, I'll, I'll try and uh, find out what um, that may have come from. And generally, a Google reverse image search will find it for you straight away. And it's like, oh yeah, let's copyright this guy. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, fonts, licensing around fonts can be very, very complex. Uh, it's changed a little bit in recent years with Google providing a whole lot of fonts under the Apache license. Uh, but if you do have fonts in your release, look at the font metadata. Um, make sure you have permission to distribute them. Um, and Fonts are binary files, and it may not be immediately obvious how they are licensed to someone who's reviewing your release. So it may be a good idea to put that in the license file. You don't have to, uh, but that, that, at least that way you've documented it and you no one, people don't have to keep double checking the, what is the license of this font. Um, now, the licenses that I've been talking about so far, there's, there's certain legal obligations you need to comply with. Like the MIT license says you must include the text of this license. That's about the only restriction that it, that it has. Um, Apache policy adds a little bit more. Um, and as that is that you must have a notice file and all the licenses must be listed in license, probably even if they're not required. That's It's not set in stone, but it's it's... It's a good idea to do that, again, from a, a review point of view. Um, so the license file is in the root directory, and it's either called license or license.txt. And it contains the list of license of, of the, uh, it contains the Apache license, and then a list of all the licenses of the bundled software. Now, notice it's only the bundled software, not what you depend on. Um, and there's two ways that you can do this. You can either take the full text of the license and stick it in there. Or you can put a, a short form that just has a pointer to the text of the license. Now that pointer is not a URL. It's actually to a physical file. Uh, the reason that you don't want to put it to a URL is that URLs change over time or may disappear or may die or, or whatever. Um, license again may be different for source and binary files because they have different contents. So you need to be aware of that. Question out the back. Um, I, I have seen that in one or two projects. It's probably okay, but it, it's it's a little confusing unless it's clearly marked. Um, so, sorry, the question was, could I could I just have one license file that included all the licenses for the source and binary, uh, but clearly mark that one section is for source and one section is binary? And yes, that is okay. So here's a example license file. And then we have the notice file. Now, that contains the ASF uh, copyright, I believe. And it has a year in there, and you need to keep the year up to date. 
Um, and it only should have what's needed in there. The reason for that is that anyone who uses your software must take the contents of their notice file and add it to theirs. Um, so generally what is only required is relocated copyright notices, so things that have been removed from source code that are not, no longer clear. Any required notices from other included Apache software and anything else. Now, the documentation we currently have isn't really clear 100% on what goes into a notice file. It says all required notices other than these things except if this. And it's like, ugh, makes no sense whatsoever. But not much at all needs to go in a notice file is what it comes down to. You don't need to list all the copyrights of all the software in the notice file, only ones that the headers have been relocated from. Um, anything that's a licensing information should go in the licensing file. It shouldn't go in the notice file. Uh, so it, it's generally fairly minimal, uh, but it's often where, where mistakes are well. Here's a very, very minimal uh, notice file here. So yeah, as I was saying with the required notices, there's some confusion to what a required notice is. Um, about the only thing I can think of is advertising clauses. Um, uh, but the issue with that is most things that have advertising clauses are actually category X, so you'll never see them in a notice file. <laughs> so, um, but if there is a required notice, uh, you must include a link to the original source. Uh, oh, sorry, some category B software requires you to have a link to the original source and how to get the original as a requirement. That should go in the notice file. And some licenses require that you must state any changes have been made. Um, so that would probably go in the notice file as well. So, but there's not much that needs to go in there, and there's certainly a bit of leeway about what gets included and what doesn't get included. I think a bit about the style. It must be in the license to order notice. Yeah. It's a stylistic issue as to which you have there. Yeah. Some some people have very strong opinions on it though. So if you. Yeah. And <laughs> Yeah, so I mentioned the, the license categories uh, before. So there's category A, which you can bundle in your software and you can depend on uh, and will link to or you know whatever it is. Um, basically, they don't add any restrictions above and beyond what the Apache License 2.0 does. So common licenses, uh, lichens, that's a good one. <laughs> common licenses include, <laughs> sort of like licenses just grow on you. <laughs> Common licenses include the Apache 2.0 license, Apache 1.1, 1 .1, uh, two clause, well, three clause BSD without the advertising clause, uh, MIT, or X11 as originally known, W3C, Unicode, CC copyright only, and the W2F public license. Um, so you can include all of those, and as long as the, you mention them in license, you're generally good. Category B licenses you can't include in a source release because they contain some restriction of use, generally. There's, there's, they vary a little bit. Um, by including them in a binary form, it means it limits the chance of the license corrupting the Apache license, and that's generally good. So the common ones you'd run into there are the CDDL, the Eclipse license, and the Mozilla license, and Creative Commons uh, attribution as well. Um, that's only for uh, media, I believe, the Creative Commons one. You can't have code that's under Creative Commons attribution. So there's, there's some, some restrictions around that. And then there's the things that you cannot include and cannot depend on. And that generally is GPL, LGPL, any sort of non-commercial license, um, JSON. JSON has been recently added uh, because of the uh, do good not evil clause which is uh, open to interpretation. <laughs> uh, there's the four clause BSD license and possibly the Apache 1.0 license, uh, which is sort of a bit odd. Um, I, yeah, it, it's come up a couple of times and people have just said, uh, I, we don't want to go there. <laughs> but it, by my reading and understanding of it is that you couldn't actually include Apache 1.0 in an Apache 2.0 product. Um, yeah. We don't want any unexpected binary files in the source release. Um, so that's no executables, DLLs, jars, or class files, please. You can include images, you can include fonts, you can include stuff that is binary, but not uh, source code. 
there's a few exceptions. I've, I've seen releases past that have um, like fake jars for a test. Like the jar is actually empty. It's not really a real jar. It doesn't really contain code. But often there's a way around this, and that is just to take the code and compile it as part of the compile it into the jar as part of the test anyway. So just the, the, this is generally the number one reason that the uh, releases get voted uh, minus one on. Um, you need to have all the license source file must have an ASF header. Um, be careful about that because the ASF header has changed a little bit over time from the 1.1 to 2.0 and occasionally I still run into ASF headers that have copyright lines in them. You should not have a copyright line. Unless... So the, uh, the Apache license recommends a header at the bottom that is not the header that Apache gives. So yes. you know our license says use a header, recommends a header, the one you should use is separate. Yeah, the, uh, the question there, well the clarification I guess, uh, was that the Apache license itself has a header that says you should use in your code don't use that one. That's what we want other people to use. Uh, ASF has their own policy and they have their own header that you must put on all, the, all of your code. Um, and that's very clearly documented though on those links that I've, I've, I've pointed to you before. Um, make sure that people can compile the source. Um, have clear instructions on how to do it. If it doesn't work on a certain platform, note that. Right? Um, you don't want to have someone spend half an hour trying to get it to work on OS X when it never was supposed to work on OS X. Um, if you need to, some setup or you need to download third party components to get it to compile, write that down. <laughs> make, it, make it easy for someone to be able to review your release and you're much more likely to get a plus one vote. Um, one of the things I've done, um, and I was, oh, I'm hoping to do a few more of these, but I've, I've, I haven't really found the time so far, is that I've made an, a fictional Apache project called Apache Wombat. Um, and I've uh, put it up in GitHub, and I have step-by-step -step text and explanation showing how I would make the license and notice files. And I've also made a short video of five minutes showing how I did that. So it, it's fairly clear and straightforward. Um, you might want to go have a look at that. Um, and this is basically the steps. So it's using Bootstrap. Um, and what I do is I get boilerplate license and notice files. I update the notice file to have the right copyright year, copy, correct copyright and year. Now we're including Bootstrap. That's MIT licensed. Note that different versions of Bootstrap have had different licenses. So you've got to be careful with that. And I think Bootstrap 4 has new license as well. I'll have to double check that. But it does in bundle other things as well now. So that's, this will change if you were using Bootstrap 4 versus Bootstrap 3. Um, if you have a look at the, the, the contents of the file, you'll notice there's the HTML shiv is being used. That's dual licensed MIT GPL. If something is dual licensed, you take the most compatible license. So in this case, I think, well, we, we, we know GPL's category X. We don't want to use that. MIT is a compatible license with the Apache license, so we'll use that and we add that to the license file. Um, there's also respond.js and query in there. So it uses those things, but they're not actually bundled. So we don't have to mention them. So you don't have to add anything to the license file or notice file for that. Um, if you look inside the bootstrap code, at some point in there it uses normalize.js. So because that is bundled, we do need to add that to the license file, and that's MIT licensed. Again, MIT is a, a compatible license, so there's, there's no problems there. And lastly, we have some font files, which are glyph icon. Now, trying to find how these fonts are licensed is a little tricky, because if you look at the metadata, it actually is incorrect. Uh, but if you go back to the source of where they came from and bootstrap, it actually says they're licensed under the bootstrap license, which is MIT licensed. So um, Glyph Icon was a commercial product and they made some deal with Bootstrap to allow free use of their fonts. So sometimes you're going to run into com complexities like that even with well-known software like, like Bootstrap. Um, there's a few nice to haves as well. These are not required but they just make things easy. Uh, having an up-to-date readme so we know what has changed from one release to the next release always helps. Uh, for example, if you, if you have a complex licensing situation 
uh, and your last release passed, and you note in the readme that there's been no third-party files added, uh, the licensing is going to be exactly the same. So you know we basically don't have to check that. Um, list all the changes and make sure you have a keys file published so that people can actually verify the signatures on, on your release. Um, common mistakes. As I said, unexpected binary files in source releases, contents of license and notice files, the source and binary have the same files when they should be different, not putting the release in the correct place. Um, less common recently, uh, but for a while people were sticking them in home directories and sticking them up in Maven and not sticking them in the, the, the proper release area. Um, missing disclaimer is, uh, happens quite a bit too, surprisingly. Um, and missing headers as well. well. That's not so common, but just be careful with the rat exclusions and, and make sure that they're not too wide. Uh, and you, you, you know, uh, just because it's testing code, and it's you know, it still has to be licensed correctly. You you, you need to, you need to make sure of that. Uh, the other issue with binary releases is that they have to comply in the same way as source distributions, but the contents could be different, and so you may need a different license and notice file. Best way to do this is to actually look inside all of the jars that you have in your binary release, and you can just do that with with a text editor. Because uh, generally they're just a compressed file and you can see all the path names there. And if you look at all the path names, you can generally work out what's bundled and what licenses they're, 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 they're under. Um, if you make some mistakes with a binary distribution, uh, people are probably not going to vote minus one on it unless it's really major. Because um, they're not actually official releases. Um, so they're provided for convenience only. It's the source release that, 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 is, that is the more important one. So where to ask for help? Um, ask on your mailing lists. Ask your project mentors. Ask, if you don't get any luck with either of those, ask incubator. And for legal questions, ask legal discuss. Um, every few years this crops up. <laughs> um, the incubator is broken. <laughs> uh, I don't think it is. I think it works pretty well, actually. Um, there's room for improvement. That's for sure. Um, and it adds a lot of value for a small amount of work for those involved. Uh, it, it's quite, uh, what did I say? We had 60 plus incubating projects. We get through a dozen releases a month, something along those lines. Um, it's, for a group of volunteers, we don't do too badly. But, um, if you want to see, if, another good way to, to, to work out whether you might run into problems or not is just follow the list a little bit. I'm not saying read every single email on it. Um, and just see, have a look at other releases and why people voted minus one on those. And you'll see that that, that, that may be some issues that you may have to run into. Um, and we can certainly do with more help, get involved. Um, I think one of the, one thing we are doing wrong is that we put podlings through this incubating process and have the people that are making the releases, uh, they then become top level projects, but we don't see them again. Those people who put, went through the release projects are the perfect people to review other releases in the incubator. Um, and currently how it's set up is that um, generally you have to be a member to be asked to be included in the incubator PMC. There are a few people who have done it the other way in that they've just turned up on the incubator list, reviewed a few releases and so forth, and have actually been voted in. Um, I think myself and John are, are two people who've done that. Um, I don't know of any others. Um, so, yeah, get involved. <laughs> yes? I think um, your last point there about having more people who are doing releases. If you're doing a vote on your mailing list and one of the contributors, so not a member of your, your committed group, mm -hmm. minus one in it, this is the, like, just because the vote has technically the people whose vote counts, it really doesn't matter if you've got mm -hmm. someone Yeah. If, yeah. If you vote on releases, even though your vote is not binding, eventually we'll probably vote you in, so it is binding. Uh, but it gives a good indication that someone else has looked at the release, and if you find a problem, then other people are likely to change their vote. Uh, well, if you say that it's a good thing, then it's probably a good thing, <laughs> and it gives other people confidence that they're, they're more likely to vote. 
plus one. Um, that doesn't mean that everyone who voted on the dev list, like if you had 20 people vote plus one on it, should jump on the incubator and vote plus one. <laughs> That's um, Another good idea is when you're voting on releases, actually list out what you've checked uh, rather than just say plus one. Like it's like, okay, I, I don't know whether you just looked at it and said, yep, that's good. Or whether you actually, you know, got a magnifying glass out and had a bit more of a closer look. So that's a, a good idea. Um, so yeah, any ideas on how we can prove? Contact us, email us at the at general at incubator at Apache at Ord. Um, we're happy to talk about it, probably a little too much. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, just um, Apache Rat is another tool. Um, there's also Apache Whisker, which I haven't actually looked into, but it looks like a really interesting idea in that it describes licenses via metadata. Uh, so you might want to check that out. Um, it could sort of automate the whole licensing thing. Um, it's, it seems like a lot of work, I have to say, and there's almost always exceptions, but it, it, I, I like the concept. Um, yeah, okay, so that's it from me. Do we have any questions? Yes? Uh, so the uh, example you gave with Apache Wombat, where you, you know, yep. included Bootstrap CSS and all that stuff, um, and validated the licenses, mm -hmm. um, does that just apply for uh, projects that are actually uh, releasing Bootstrap in the, like, the actual project versus just the website for the project? Like, do you have to do license validation stuff? Or just okay, so the, the question was, do you have to do license validations for the website? Uh, if it's using Bootstrap? Um, the answer is no, but it depends whether you include the Bootstrap code in your source release or not. If you had a website um, and your source release didn't include the website, then you wouldn't need to mention Bootstrap in your source release. So it is only if it's in the release? Yeah, it is only if it's on the release. You can put whatever you want on your, on, okay. on your website. There's no, no issues around that. As long as you have ways to use it on the website. Yeah. Yeah, no, no other people's cat photos, please. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Um, yes. Is there some signing of PGP keys? Can you say uh, where, where can we get help around that? OK, so signing of PGP keys, you mean actually signing a release yourself or getting your key signed um, to become part of the web of trust? I don't understand on that process. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's a little complex. Uh, it is well documented though. Uh, I can't remember the URL off the top of my head, but there is a, a, an Apache page that goes through step by step by step what you have to do. Um, and ask your mentors for help. They, they will, they will definitely I, help I, you. I, I, signed, I have a key, mm -hmm. which I believe is shared upon my TLP project, but I think that's incorrect. I signed releases with my key, and at one, one point, not time ago, I, I destroyed that key, so it's verified. Mm -hmm. Well, what you can do a couple of things with your keys. Um, you can publish them. There's um, a public server that you can publish them to, yeah, right. and it may that may have already happened. And generally, when you run PGP, it will get look for the keys at that server. Okay. Um, the other thing is you make a keys file and you put your your public key in that, and you, you distribute that with the release. So. As long as someone can get hold of the key um, in one way or another, you can also attach it to your Apache login in some way, and it's recorded in LDAP, but I can't remember exactly what the steps are to do that. Yes. Okay, we are out of time, so thank you very much for coming along. <laughs>